Welcome to those of you who have joined in. We see the numbers are rising up. We have um, folks joining in. Welcome. My name is Sandra Oberdorfer. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Friendly House. And um, we are launching tonight what I hope will be the first of many um, community-driven online conversations um, about Portland and the, the wonderful community we live in. Um, I'd like to welcome tonight uh, Kim Moreland from the Oregon Black Pioneers, who will be speaking to speaking and sharing with us a PowerPoint presentation about uh, Louisa Flowers and the permanent exhibit that is at Home Forward right now. Um, I'd also like to welcome Michael Bonacore from Home Forward, the executive director, um, Helen Leiser from uh, Friendly House and um, Joanne Hardesty, the commissioner from Portland City Council. Um, I'd also like to give a, a thank you for the tech support tonight. It's, uh, Rebecca Little Blair and Denise LaFond, um, who you also see in your video screens here. Um, if you have any questions, a few little uh, things about the webinar format. First of all, we are all learning, so that is the the energy with which we, we bring this to this tonight. Um, your questions at the, well, let me back up first. I'll talk a little bit about how the evening will go. We'll, we'll uh, enjoy Kim's PowerPoint presentation. And then um, after that, we will open up the discussion for uh, questions from the attendees. Um, attendees, you are you are empowered to listen and to contribute questions, but the speaking tonight and the conversation is really for our community leaders who are on the video. Um, as you think about questions you'd like to ask, do of course offer questions to Kim about the exhibit, but our topic additionally for the evening is on housing in, in Portland specifically, but, but maybe also in general. Um, as you write questions in, let's do keep the questions on topic. Um, even if we have curious questions that we'd like to go sideways with, we do have um, only a limited amount of time this evening. Um, and I think with that, we can actually launch over to Kim. Um, panelists, I see you're all on mute right now. Um, I will mute myself and then um, we will stay kind of to the side. And Kim, you have the floor. Thank you. Share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about Louisa Matilda um, Stacker Flower and the incredible contribution that her family made um, to the city of Portland. And as Sandra mentioned, I'm on the board of the Oregon Black Pioneers. And our mission in a nutshell is simply to educate everyone about Oregon's Black history. And we do that in several ways. We, Publish, uh, two publications, one in which I authored about Portland African-American community, and we also author a book about African-Americans and million in Polk County. We conduct presentations like this one. We also um, work on exhibits like we did with the Home Flower, with the Home Forward exhibit. And we also have bus tours from time to time. We just, um, hired a wonderful executive director. We were an all-volunteer organization until 2020, and, um, and we're looking forward to doing great things. Um, the Home Forward exhibit was um, actually a brainchild of one of the Home Forward um, CFOs. <laughs> And he um, had read about Louisa Flowers and just thought that she had such a regal nature about her and really wanted to learn more about her. And so um, I worked closely with um, a design team, um, myself and another board member, Elise Gautier, and um, Pam Cambure, who is a home forward project manager, and, um, and also Eden and 
um, Elton, um, I'm sorry, Brian and Elton Potter, the Potter Design, um, designed this beautiful exhibit that outside of the, uh, inside the courtyard of the Louisa Flowers building. Let's talk a little bit about um, Louisa. Um, this is a picture of her at the age of 23. Um, her maiden name is either Thacker or Booth. We really don't know. It, it shows up more in the um, census and other documents as Thacker, but um, there's some evidence that her maiden name may have been Booth. She was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1849. She had um, a sister named Clara who had twin boys. Um, her mother was born in Puerto Rico and her father was African-American. Um, according to the Cadian Genealogy Index, Louisa Booth uh, was from the United States and lived in Victoria, Canada in 1881. And I want to explore this uh, Canada connection further. We, don't, we do not know a lot about um, Louisa life before she married Alan Flowers in 1882 and moved to Portland. However, we do know that she had a Victorian British Columbia connection. According to her marriage license, she married Alan in Victoria, um, Canada. Her grandfather, Samuel J. Booth, who's pictured here, um, was a resident of Victoria from 1858 to 1917. Picture here, he is one, he, I'm sorry, he is one of four black men who formed a company to mine gold in Leechtown, Canada in the Leech River in 1864. Almost immediately, Booth found a gold nugget as big as a hen's egg, and the nugget was on display for several days at the Wells Fargo office. And one interesting fact is that in 1860, the governor of the Victoria Providence was recruiting African Americans specifically specifically from California, because um, he was half black and he wanted, um, and he knew that uh, African Americans in California were facing some really tough times. They had a poll tax on African American. They actually had them wearing um, a kind of like a, a chain, a, a kind of a, a, a chain around their neck that they, um, you know, signifying that they, had to wear, you know, had to pay a pro, pro tax. So a lot of a lot of Californians were eager to leave and and settled in Victoria. So if you ever have time, check out that history of Black Victorians in, in Canada. But um, in a family memoir written by one of Victoria, um, one of Louisa's and Allen's sons, Ralph Flowers, in 1955, Grandpa Booth lived on the family farm in Lent near Mount Scott. According to Ralph, Grandpa Bo Grandfather Booth was a husky man of six feet three inches and a good physical health. And he loved to eat and he loved to watch them work and tell them how, to, how it to be done. One of the interesting things about um, the, the, the contributions of the Flowers family was so remarkable because they were completed during uh, a time where African Americans were restricted um, and prohibited to live in the Oregon, the state of Oregon. What you see here is the evolution of black exclusion laws. And the Oregon Constitution adopted in 1857 banned slavery, but also excluded blacks from legal residence. It was made illegal for blacks to be in Oregon or to own real estate, make contracts, vote, or use legal system. A black exclusion clause was included when Oregon became a state. And this, of course, discouraged a large um, migration of, of blacks to Oregon. When Louisa Flowers come to Oregon in 1882, the population the black population was, was under 500 in, or in the state of Oregon. And so it was much smaller in the city of Portland. Eventually, the population grew to roughly 2,500 by in the next few decades where we, where we would 
it would remain the, at uh, 2,500 um, by 1940 in World War II. This is the beautiful Flowers family. I love this picture. Um, mentioned earlier, Louisa Mary's Allen Irvin Flowers in 1882. Um, Allen was born in 1847 in Columbus, Ohio, and he arrived in Portland in 1865. He was a cabin boy among um, the brother Johnston, Jonathan Steamer. He jumped ship in Portland and hides in the bushes until the, the ship leaves and he begins a life in Portland. Lucky for him, Brother Jonathan um, sinks a few months later on July 30th, 1865. The ship was carrying 244 passengers and a large shipment of gold. And they, and um, you might have a few years back, they were the expedition to find that gold as a part of a treasure hunt. When Louisa Allen meets um, Allen, he is either divorced or widow. It's really inconsistent in the census. In 1870, it says he's, he's divorced. In 1880, it says he's a widow. But regardless, he was grieving. Um, he had just lost two small ch children, and his only surviving child was a, a daughter with a daughter named Harriet um, that was nicknamed Hattie. And Hattie, at the age of 11, was listed um, as a witness at their marriage in Victoria. Much is not known about Hattie's whereabouts after the couple marries. Um, early census or early directory information said that she lived with, um, with uh, Allen before he, she married um, Louisa in Portland. And, but when she gets older, in her 20s, we don't, we don't see her anymore. Together, the couple had four boys. Um, in the family portraits, seated from left to right is Alan, Flowers, Louisa, their oldest son, um, Lloyd. In the back row, left to right is Irvin, Elmo, and Ralph Flowers. According to a family memoir that was written by Ralph that I talked about earlier that was entitled On the Farm, the family moved to Mount Scott in 1901 and purchased a 20-acre farm and leases an adjoining 385 acres where they rented um, a pasture land and kept herd, a herd of cows, sheep, and wild horses. The land originally owned and leased by the flowers is now the site of the Lincoln Memorial Cemetery and both Allen and Louisa are buried there. Allen was a respected farmer. Um, he was appointed by Governor Oswald West to represent Oregon at a national farming conference in Alabama. And, um, and by the way, Governor West was a very progressive governor. He championed the women's suffrage, which supported women voted. He supported workers' compensation, prison reform, prohibition, and um, a few other progressive things. He was, I don't know about prohibition being progressive, but <laughs> however, um, he was considered one of the most brilliant governors in Oregon. And I, I want to show you that uh, this is their dog, Dan. That's Alan Flowey. That's Louisa with her Louisa with her rifle. I'm thinking this is Grandpa Bruce, and this is the horse Maud. Louisa and Allen would often entertain people from the city at their farm. Picture here are members of the three early churches, First AME Zion, Bethel AME, and Mount Oliver at a gathering at the Flowers Farm. And this this um, photo is courtesy of the Oregon Historical Society, but it's part of the Verdell Auto Rutherford, Verdell, Verdon, and Auto Rutherford collection. And the Rutherfords are, and the um, flowers up uh, in this picture. Number nine is Louisa. This is a uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Rutherford. This is um, Otto Rutherford, which is Charlotte Rutherford's father. And this is her grandmother. And in the back row, 
is the Flowers Brothers. Um, that's Ralph and, and a, uh, 13 and 12. And then you see in the back is some Rutherford, members of the Rutherford family as well, which is another pioneer family. The, um, the Flowers family was community builders similar to Black pioneers of their time. They were committed to progress of Black people. Louisa was involved in early, the uh, early Colored Women's Club and was a faithful member of the Old Road Club. Ralph Flowers described his mom as a devout Christian and devoted member of Bethel AME Church. And he said that Allen was a mixture of people and he was, he was also a trustee of, of Bethel. Um, and Mrs. Flowers, uh, Louisa would raise money for um, the scholarship fund for young black people and was a consistent fundraiser for the William Avenue YWCA, which is now the Billy Webb Elk Lodge, which was recently um, designated as a National Historic Landmark. Here is a 1890 holiday edition map. It shows the, the west side is downtown where you see a, a rapid growth and the east side is an emerging um, uh, suburb that's uh, developing. And, um, and the red L indicate where the present day home for a building is, and the blue L indicates the home that the flowers built in 18, well, I'm not sure they built them, but the houses were built in 1885. As you can see, the west side is very developed and the east side is beginning to develop. And that's because the Broadway Bridge and the Steel Bridge was constructed. Uh, people started to migrate across to the east side to a more residential area. Um, and you also, by 1930, the Hawthorne Bridge, the Burnside Bridge, the Selwood, and the St. John Bridge were all constructed. And at the turn of the century, African Americans are scattered throughout the city of Portland. Um, so you can see them um, in Southeast Portland, um, Northwest, Southwest, Tibet, had an enclave of African Americans, and you, you guys might recognize some of the names like the Diaz, Diaz I, I, I might be mispronouncing that name, but um, it was the family of um, uh, who, who um, is the in laws of the first um, African American um, judge, uh, Mercedes Diaz. And here's a picture of the Billy Well, Billy Well uplock that I mentioned before. And Louisa Flowers really seeded into the, the construction. Prior to becoming the Billy Well uplock, it was the colored dot um, YWCA, which was controversial in its time. And Beatrice Moore, Beatrice Ke Ke Moore Kennedy was really opposed the colored YWCA. And, and um, but it eventually changed its name to the Williams Avenue YWCA, and now today it's the Billy Webb Elk Lodge. And um, uh, Allen um, Flowers uh, home ownership was a strong, strong value for Allen and Louisa Flowers. They understood the, how economic justice was tied to own, owning real estate. Louisa Flowers is listed in the Morning Agonian land transaction section in 1901, 1901 and 1902 with um, land being transferred to her. Allen Flowers and E.D. Kennedy, who would uh, uh, become the ex-husband of Beatrice Mall Kennedy and the co-editor of the Advocate newspaper, which is the early black newspaper, were members of the Home Ownership Association, and they were noted for organizing a public lecture for Booker T. Washington in 1914. And Booker T. Washington, you know, uh, the early African American leader who was the first president of Tuskegee University, labeled as a conservative, Washington urged Black people to buy farmland as a real estate investment and save money. And he was predicting that the uh, migration of Europeans because of the 
completion of the Panama Canal will bring European immigrants who will be wanting to buy the farmland. This is another population map, and this shows from 1900 to 1940 is a gradual growth in the African American population. And before World War II, um, there's a whopping 2,500 people in, in Black people in, in, um, in Oregon. Um, and which, um, and as I said before, they were scattered throughout Portland and there was a, you know, enclave in Southeast, Southeast Tibet, Southeast Pine, Northwest Everett, Northwest Davis had, was the home of several Black businesses. Um, you had the Golden West Hotel that was started in 1906 and which closed um, after, during the Depression. And several early Black pioneers like um, Alan Flowers lived in the waterfront area prior to moving um, to Northeast. By 1910, the Flowers were listed in the Polk Directory as living in Northeast Portland at 38.7 Northeast First Street later renumbered to 1815 Northeast First. And the picture here are three of the four homes that they lived in, and each of the sons, the flower sons, resided in one of those homes. A quick fact is that the Allen Lewis Flowers homes were demolished. I mean, the actual home of, um, of Allen and Louisa, um, 38.7 Northeast First, were demolished prior to 1998. The other three homes were demolished recently in 2019 while we were working on the Home Forward Project. And by 1930, the Broadway still bridge, um, by 1930, as I mentioned earlier, the Broadway Bridge, the Steel Bridge, the Selwood Bridge, and St. John's and Burnside were constructed. There's a rapid redevelopment of the East Side, and but also an intense introduction of housing discrimination. In 1919, the real estate board started to redline and concentrate African Americans in an area which is now occupied by the Memorial Coliseum, and which is which called the Broadway Steel Track, which is to my to the left, is um, was a, a number of homes owned by African Americans. From 1920 to 1940, most, most African Americans live in this area um, between the Broadway Bridge and the Steel Bridge. And this is a slide of Memorial, the construction of the Memorial, Memorial Coliseum. And I think it's a dramatic image of, of, of the land that was cleared um, to make room to displace African-American families to construct the Memorial Coliseum. And at the city of Portland Archives has some beautiful photos of the houses that were um, that was uh, just demolished, and also Bethel AME Church was located on Larrabee. Um, and I just think if none of that would have happened, it would have been an amazing African American historic district. Because every time I look up for, like, you know, an, uh, a pioneer, they lived on Larrabee or Benton or McMillan. And, um, Louisa Flower dies in 1928 and Allen dies later in 1934. The Flower's sons follow their parents' legacy as community builders. Picture here are Ralph and Ruth Flower and their son Clifford um, standing in front of the Flower's homes on Northeast First and Skyler. The couple owned a Jitney bus, which is a, an older, uh, old fashioned version of Uber. <laughs> and Ralph becomes um, an auto mechanic from 1919 to, to 1952. He's a foreman at the municipal, municipal garage and he is the first African American civil service worker. And he's also, he was an entrepreneur. Ruth was an active member of the Federation of Colored Women's Club. She was the state president of the Oregon Association of Colored Women from 1927 to 1930. And as I was reading about Clifford, he was just an amazing young, young man, but his life was cut short when he was killed returning home from 
University of Oregon. Um, Lloyd is, uh, he married Madeline and the divorce in 1927, but he remarried and um, Lloyd and Jesse are homeowners and they work and he worked as an iron worker and does several other, um, and he also worked for the Union Pacific Railroad and both of Madeline and Lloyd are really active. Um, Irvin became the president of the Portland branch of the NWACT in 1928 and he died in 1955, but prior to his death, She's everywhere uh, from the Urban League to the, um, to the NAACP. And Elmer Elma and Thelma Flowers, um, Elmer retired as the Railway Mail Express, Express Clerk, which was a very prestigious position for the railroad. And Thelma is also very active in the Women's Club and the Federation of Colored, Colored Women Association. Here is a picture of uh, Ralph Flowers' auto repair shop. Um, and his, he's, he's right here. And this is uh, Peterson Cooper, a friend of his and a neighbor. And um, the flowers, this building is still standing. It, it, was, um, it became the Cotton Club that was owned by Paul Nogs. And now um, I recently saw that it was had another ownership, but the building is still standing, which is really cool. Um, and a, a quick note about Peterson Cooper, his first wife was a photographer who traveled with the Smoke Jumpers, who was a, an African-American uh, group that put out fires, um, that put out wildfires and wildfires and lived in um, Pendleton, was stationed in Pendleton. And she was before her time and just an amazing woman that needs more recognition. And I think, I believe her name was Margaret Robinson. And finally, I, I just wanna say thank you. This is me and Elise Gautier. She is the master editor and she really helped <laughs> editing the exhibit. Um, and it was one of, uh, it, was, it was a great project to work on. And um, I thought I'll, I'll end my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kim. I, it's, it's, it's so fantastic. I've been taking notes as, as you've been talking. I'm like, very interesting. Um, so we are going to um, switch over to our question and answer portion. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Rebecca. Um, she put the, the website for Oregon Black Pioneers in the chat. And um, so we have two options for attendees to share questions with the, um, with the uh, panelists and um, Kim, you can also see that people are also sharing uh, their enthusiasm for the presentation itself. Um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I will try to keep up with the chat as I can, but, but some of those may get lost in the, in the other comments as well. Um, I would like to start our, our conversation with a, um, with a kind of an open, open start where we go with um, what does community mean to you and um, uh, I don't really know how to how to choose who begins. Um, Joanne would you like to start our our piece here? Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, good evening uh, and thank you so much Kimberly for that very fascinating presentation. Mm -hmm. I was actually trying to remember the flowers person who we call the mother of Juneteenth in uh, Oregon um, because uh, she was elderly when I met her and she died a few years back but I could not remember her first name and so with you talking about the family that I was like trying to remember what her first name was. Was it Regina or Claire? Claire. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, and uh, so that she was my introduction as an elder in the community. She was certainly my introduction uh, to Juneteenth. I'm from Baltimore and I had never heard of Juneteenth before I moved to Portland. <laughs> I'm like, what is this, right? And uh, so I had to do some self-education around that. Um, and so what does home mean to me? Uh, is that the question? Is that, was that the appropriate question? What is um, home? Community, but home also works. Community. Well, I think community is a, is a better question. I was gonna say home was a little difficult because uh, uh, as people who are mobile and travel all over the planet, right? It's, it's like I'm home wherever I am and people accept me and love me. Uh, but community is actually made up of people that uh, some you get to choose, uh, to be close to and connected to. But community, to me, are um, a diversity of people that choose to live in a certain community um, and choose to coexist together. And so a thriving um, uh, community is one where people know their neighbors. Uh, I, you know, I'm from Baltimore, so I'm used to knowing everybody that lives around me. And even today, a new person moves in, I will take a pie over and introduce myself. Uh, and, and, and do what, I, what my mother used to do. Who are your people, right? Where are you from, right? Do you, have, do you have kids, right? And I go through the whole gambit. I know they're exhausted by the time I welcome them to the neighborhood. But to me, it's really important. Community is all about knowing your neighbors, knowing what the norms are in your community, and knowing um, that if, if something goes wrong, that you know people that you can go and connect with and help fix it, right? So for me, that's what community is. Thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to offer your your version or your, your response? Sure, yeah. I, I actually wore a shirt for the question tonight. So um, what this made me think about was a couple of years ago, I went to Provincetown in Massachusetts. Um, and if folks aren't familiar with it, it's kind of the queerest little place in America. Um, and I, I had never been there before, and I was there for a few days, um, and I was just walking around, and I sort of stopped in my tracks because I realized that I felt um, just safe, and I saw myself reflected everywhere, everywhere, um, and I felt like I belonged and like who I was was okay, was good, you know? Um, and uh, so I wore this shirt tonight, which says Trey Butch uh, and has a little cupcake on it. <laughs> because when I was in Provincetown, I would wear things like this and I would just walk out the door. Like I didn't think about where I was going or, or what I was doing. Um, and I will wear this shirt pretty much anywhere in Portland, but I do think about it, right? And so, I, I hold that in my heart as like how everybody should feel in community here and in this country. And like, I, until I had it, I didn't even know I, that I didn't fully, you know? I mean, in many ways I do feel safe. I feel welcomed, I feel honored here, um, but not all the time. Um, and, and I'm a white man who walks around pretty safe in the world, right? And so if I had that profound experience, like when I think about community, I think about what am I doing to create that sense of safety and belonging for everybody here? And until everybody has it, like we, we just have to keep doing our work. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, that's, that's fantastic. Helen, how would, how would this community mean to you? Mm -hmm. This is such a great question, and I think it's a really important question, and I, I love hearing everybody's, um, what community means to everyone. For me, it's, it is about the people. It's about how we care for one another, about the safety that we provide one another. It's about coming together and learning from one another and being accepting and honoring each other with respect and dignity. It's, and for me, it's the little things like, you know, you're walking down the street and you make eye contact and you acknowledge somebody. And, and it's, you know, picking up the piece of trash off the sidewalk. And, um, and so it's, 
it's, it's, you know, looking out for my neighbor and bringing in their trash bin, you know, um, you know, on Thursday morning and, um, and letting them know that their garage door is open at late at night when I know that that's very atypical of them. And it's, it's, um, yeah, you know, it's welcoming, welcoming them and saying hi and acknowledging their existence. And so, um, and I think when, when we can, and then it's about giving back as well. So it's, it's about providing a space where people can receive when they need to receive. And then when we're in a place to give that we give, that we give as well. And again, I think that guess that goes back to taking care of, of one another and the space in which we are habitating and, and taking up. So, thank you, Kim. I'd love to hear what community means for you. You know, um, given it's Black History Month, I have done a lot of research um, on different Black pioneers, and I'm just amazed at the sense of community that they had. And I and I know it's because of they were living in some really, you know, stressful times where they had to depend on one another and um, they couldn't shop at certain places, they couldn't eat at certain places, so they had to um, exchange, you know, you know, commodities with one another and, and they often entertained in their homes because they didn't really have access to, you know, public accommodations and, but it, it had a great, you know, business district and, you know, west side downtown and I just love hearing about the Rutherford brothers and and um and I you know and I kind of grew up like that too in Cleveland, Ohio, where it was a large black community. We had access to other things, but we had a black shopping district. I I didn't really have any white teachers um in elementary, junior high or high school. Uh, my first exposure to um a large white population is when I went to college at University of Cincinnati. But yet, I was still insulated by a large African American community, and so, you know, when I think about community, I just think of people who have each other's back, who um, really there to, to help you in a crisis. I, I love what all of you are saying, and like Commissioner Hardesty, you know, we knew who your folks were. You, we knew, you know, you knew we knew you by name, <laughs> and. Um, and when I came to Oregon, it was a culture shock for me. And I think the first time I saw African Americans was at the Lloyd Center. And that was some 30, 30 uh, years ago with some change. <laughs> but I, but I, I love Oregon because it has helped me to build community with other people outside my race. And so, and, and broaden what that means to me and what community means. And it, it, it's taking care of each other, like you all have said. And, and, and really um, um, putting yourself out there to, to love and to care for others. And, I, and that's what was so evident in um, the small black community is that they reported everything in the paper. If you were sick, if you was ill, it was, it was in the paper. <laughs> but, uh, and so it was such a really uh, small and loving community that, and I just think that's that's what community means to me, and I, you know, I like to apply that, you know, in a broad, in a broader, you know, in a broader sense, you know. Thank you, um, Kim. One thing I, I, I thought of when when you were giving your presentation and and talking about uh, Larrabee and uh, McMillan Street and how the Memorial Coliseum areas change so much. Um, I, I wonder in what, I'm trying to think of this, put this in the form of a question. Um, what are some of the ways in which we see community in, in housing changing in the, now and, and in the coming years? Um, specific, maybe not even just in that one area of Larrabee, which was the more historic Black community in Portland, but um, itself. Does anyone want to jump in on that? I've got the conversation on that question. Um, 
a lot will change about housing. The pandemic has actually created a more severe crisis. You may know that we've had three mayors that have declared a housing emergency, and yet we have more people living on the street today than the first mayor de uh, who declared the housing emergency. But I wanna be really clear, we only declared a housing emergency when white middle-class people all of a sudden couldn't find it affordable to live in the city of Portland. And between 2000 and 2010, when 40,000 African Americans were displaced from inner Northeast, nobody said there was a housing crisis. Nobody was concerned. It wasn't an issue. What we were told was that was progress. And so the city of Portland, like every other major metropolitan city, um, uh, had redlining, uh, made it clear that there were areas that were acceptable for Black people to live, and there were areas where it was unacceptable. Uh, we just went through a battle last year on city council to pass uh, RIP, the residential infill project. And there are many communities that still are furious that their community is going to change. Um, and I have been in a lot of those meetings with people who uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago had the privilege of buying a home um, and have had the privilege to maintain that home for 20, 30, 40 years. And when I say to them, your neighborhood will change and your, your zip code should not determine your, your, uh, where you live, right? Today in Portland, your zip code determines what your opportunities are, right? Uh, and no one's life should be measured by the zip code that they live in. So um, before the pandemic, I would have given you one answer, but since the pandemic, let me just tell you that once the housing moratorium has been lifted. I expect tens of thousands of more people that will be houseless. Um, and we are ill prepared to address that. Uh, we, yes, have a bonds to build housing, but we will never build housing fast enough to address the needs of housing that we have today. Um, and so, some immediate things that we're doing we, uh, in next month, the city council will be making some uh, zone changes that will allow for more flexibility of how land is used during an emergency. Um, give you a great real life example. Did you know the city of Portland owned four golf courses? And so when I first got here, I was like, well, why do we own golf courses? That, that right, it just doesn't make sense to me. And then we have all, we have a huge houseless population today. Why aren't we allowing houseless people to actually create space on, on the golf courses, right? They're certainly big enough, right? Um, and, um, and there's been a lot of pushback about that. But, oh no, that's for, it's, it's apparently for other people. It's not for people who find themselves without housing that they can afford to live in. Uh, let me also say that the median family income in the city of Portland is $82,500. I don't know a lot of people making $82,500. And so we have lots of empty housing that is too expensive for people who work two and three minimum wage jobs here in Portland. So they will never, ever, ever be able to afford the new housing that we're building. And what we are, what we were calling affordable housing before I got to the city of Portland uh, was pretty appalling. Uh, I remember my first few months, everybody talked about affordable housing and I would say affordable for who, right? Because there's affordable and then there's affordable, right? Uh, and uh, what I realized is the bulk of the housing that the city of Portland has built to date uh, is housing at 80% of median family income. So if you think about that, think about having to make $72,000 to qualify for affordable housing. Uh, to me, that is uh, insulting and criminal at best. Uh, and so uh, I wish I could give you good news about housing and what's happening with the state of housing in Portland. But the reality is that the uh, pandemic has exacerbated what has been a problem in Portland for all, uh, the last six, seven, eight years, right? which is that we're building housing, but we're not building housing for people who live here. We're building housing for people who will move here at some other time. Yeah, I, I, oh. Now that I can all right? <laughs> <laughs> Information that people need so that they understand why 
there are so many people living on our streets, right? And, and to me, yeah. that is a humanitarian crisis, right? And normally in a, in a crisis, what happens? The Red Cross comes in, right? You set up tents, you triage the most vulnerable, right? And you just keep moving people through till you solve the crisis. Three mayors and we're still in a state of housing emergency. Um, thank, thank you, Joanne. Um, uh, I think with everyone's uh, answer to the, our first question about community, um, I think almost everyone brought up the word safety and what it means to feel safe. Um, how, how, let's talk about safety a little bit. Helen, what are some thoughts that you may have about safety and housing and especially in light of everything that Joanne just shared with us? I think that the the community and culture of Portland has changed a lot. I've been here since like 22 odd years and um, and it was a small city then and and um, people were kind to one another. And, um, and you know, even though I grew up in, in California in my, in my younger years, I'm originally from New York. And so that kind of, I have a little bit more of, I have a good balance, I think, a healthy balance. <laughs> Hopefully, but it was so bizarre to me. And so, um, and I miss that. I think that, you know, when I lived in St. John's and new people were moving in, you know, my ne my neighbors before that, we would have impromptu barbecues and just pull out the, you know, somebody's barbecue and, and, and take care of each other's kids and help each other, you know, when, when somebody was out of work and help feed that person and, and support them. And then new people started coming in and they didn't even want to open their doors, much less have an impromptu barbecue. And I think that that affects, and there's a ripple effect in my mind is when, when that happens. And I, I'm not a fan of the growth in Portland and I am very much opposed to there being yet another, you know, the, the baseball stadium that folks are wanting to push. I don't, <laughs> not everyone likes that. I, I'm not very popular with everybody with that opinion, but again, we're not, <clears throat> what has happened from, from my perspective is we, we do all this building, we're not considering the impact on the schools and how they've been affected. And it doesn't seem to be providing any extra resources to the schools. And, and like, like um, Commissioner Hardesty said, it's, it's actually created a bigger, a larger crisis. And so um, it's, it's strange, you know, I was a runner and now I'm more of a slogger. But when I was running and running downtown and through through the industrial area and, and all throughout downtown and whatnot, I always felt safe. And um, I mean, I always knew that there was a chance that, you know, my car window might get broken or something. But to me also, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of normal in a city. And, and um, but, I, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, I, that feeling wasn't there anymore. And I, and I think that it's not the fault of the individual, um, but more of the fault of the system that we have created and the um, situation that we have created. And so when folks themselves are not feeling, you know, it's like, well, maybe that person's not feeling safe. Um, and they're feeling they're not, who knows when they last ate or had a warm place to sleep. And people aren't looking them in the eye and acknowledging them as human beings. And so what does, you know, and so, so there's again, a domino effect to that. And, um, and then I think of friends of mine who are part of the LGBT community and, and hearing how they don't always feel safe in this, in the city when, I thought they, I thought everybody accepted, I don't know, I, I, I've come out of a bubble in the last seven years and, um, and it's been good. It's been a good, it was high time for me to come out of that bubble and learn that not everybody feels safe here and they should. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> okay. Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts. A little bit. Okay. Think, well, no, as Helen comes out of a bubble, I I, I think it's, it's about sacrificing. We have to sacrifice all of us who have privilege and, um, and we have to start looking at the people who are homeless as, as you know, people that 
that you could be that person, you know, things didn't happen that, you know, in your life that caused that, but, and, and I, you know, um, heard a newscast, um, uh, a broadcast today, was saying that we need to couple the, the housing with, you know, um, addiction recovery programs and, and think about wraparound services so that people can really sustain themselves and get out of, out of the homelessness because the, there's a number of reasons that why they are homeless. And I, and I think we have to have a more holistic, holistic and comprehensive approach. But it starts with us. I mean, when you, you think about um, your own family, if you started your own family, all of us have probably have people, you know, relatives who are struggling with certain, you know, addictions or, or just, you know, personal trauma that's causing them to be in a position that um, could, they either are homeless or could be homeless. And so I think it starts in the family and I think we have, you know, be willing to sacrifice um, our time because it's not going to happen without us. We can't depend I just on I government. I'm sorry, I know you want to get Michael in, but I, I just want to go behind Kimberly because I think it's a, I think that there are as many people as there are houseless, there are reasons for people to be houseless. And I think we try to uh, um, equate houselessness with substance abuse. And in some cases that is true. In some cases, mental health issues are the reason why people are chronically houseless. Um, but I got to tell you, I serve on the Board of Human Solutions, and I've been on that board for like 12 years now. Um, and we have houseless families where people are working two and three jobs. It's not that people aren't doing their part. It is that it costs too darn much money to live in the city of Portland today, right? And if we don't acknowledge the income inequality that creates opportunities for people to fall through the cracks, we will never actually fundamentally solve this problem, right? Yes, there are people that need treatment, but people need uh, to live in a place where they can actually afford to live. Uh, and Portland is no longer a city where you can afford to live if you're working a minimum wage job or two or three. Thank you. I do want to come back after Michael and talk about safety because we've had this increase in gun violence and we have knee jerk reactions that we normally have, but I don't want to like talk and not let Michael have an opportunity to win. <laughs> I'll be really brief because I'm so content to sitting here listening to other brilliant people talk. So I think the thing that I will just say quickly is that we have. Portland problems, um, but we have a sickness as a country and we're not doing enough um, as a country to take care of ourselves. And so much of this is not unique to Portland and black and brown people are not safe in this country and queer people are not safe in this country and immigrants and refugees are not safe um, and homeless people are not safe and we could make better choices. Uh, Michael, you are sure sweet to the point. I love that. <laughs> um, and uh, to your point, Michael, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I guess I want to talk about what it's like to be a Black person in the public eye when white supremacists come and take over your street, um, when white supremacists actually are supported by local law enforcement, when you see law enforcement very casual when white supremacists march and then when there's a Black Lives Matters protest, uh, it's full riot gear and all hands on deck, right? Uh, we do have a systemic problem and the problem is racism. It is how race plays out every single day in the United States of America, as Michael said, right? Um, but the issue of safety, um, we have to take it from a public safety, right? When I hear public safety, I hear police. And we have to talk about community safety because community safety looks different to different people based on their lived experience. Um, and I can tell you with the rise in gun violence, which is happening not just in Portland, but all over the country, right? Um, and it should not be a surprise because in economically devastating times, uh, violence rises. Uh, child, uh, calls for uh, domestic violence are up 150%. Uh, we are getting no calls for child abuse, and we're not getting calls for child abuse, not because children aren't being abused, but because the mandatory reporters are not seeing those children, and therefore it's not being reported, right? 
uh, people are anxious, right? And when people are anxious, violence goes up. When people don't see a vision for a future, when people haven't had a paycheck for almost a year, and we got crazy people, thank goodness they're gone, uh, at the federal level, who actually were no help at all. And in fact, exacerbated the discriminatory, racist, and uh, uh, homophobic uh, 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 rhetoric uh, that we heard so often over the last four years. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I feel like I'm just the, the voice of doom and gloom. So I'm gonna actually uh, say something positive about where we are at this moment and where I think uh, coming out of this pandemic, we will be. I just realized I'm just depressing everybody because I, I just know too much. Uh, but here's the good news. The good news is though we did not, we had nothing to do with the history that Kimberly gave us. We have everything to do with the next chapter of that history book. And we get to decide what we build coming out of this pandemic. And we can continue the status quo, which means we'll get the exact same outcomes that we've been getting. Or we can actually demand that we actually have a city that's more equitable, more fair, and more just for more people. That's my goal. That sounds fantastic. And I would say the doom and gloom is um, not at all how I'm hearing it, or I don't think the rest of us are. We, we really need to hear what is really happening. And so absolutely. your voice is absolutely crucial for what we have, to, what we need to hear. Um, I would love to hear some questions from the attendees, but we're, I think people are shy or they're just wrapped listening to what we already are talking about. It's hard to know. Um, I would like to invite people to um, offer some questions. Um, I think that in keeping with the um, the questions of safety in the, uh, the, the rise, as you said, Joanne Mercy, of, of gun violence, um, and the question of does public safety equal uh, police in the city, um, what are some of the things, what are some ideas that, that you've experienced in your positions, Michael with Home Forward or Helen with Friendly House, that, that are community solutions that, that in essence, don't involve the police. That that not not that we want to demonize anyone or anything, but let's just take the time to think of many other options that are out there. And what are things that you have experienced in your own in your own sphere? Helen, I'm going to put you on the spot. Maybe, maybe not. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> I think um, one of the things that prior to the pandemic that Friendly House when you go back to, to community, um, that Friendly House has done so extraordinarily well is bring people together, people of different generation or, you know, who are multi-generational. We've got, you know, the older community, the younger community, the LGBT community, um, different cultures coming together for a movie night or to, to celebrate an event. And, um, and to see that is, is really critical and to continue doing that is critical and, and doing it, you know, virtually while we've, while we've been doing it, it is, it is very different. And I look forward to the time when everyone will feel safe enough um, from COVID to be able to come back and we can host these types of events again. And I've been trying to think of creative ways in which we might be able to do that because to see that, to bring for, for our kids to um, be around Diverse, a diverse community is really critical. And I, cause I, you know, when I, Commissioner, Commissioner Hardesty, when I listen to you, I think, God, where do we start? And, and I, and I, and I know it starts with me. And, um, and so at Friendly House, I think in many ways we have started that and, um, and we continue um, to, to reach out to our community and to, listen and learn from our community um but it's like you know, there's so much to do and where do we start writing the next chapter the good news is that you don't have to do it all right i yeah, mean that's true. it's really important for you to just figure out what's your piece because mm -hmm. i think if all of us take our piece it will be a whole lot easier for everybody right and so i it's easy to be overwhelmed because there's just so much that has to happen but I would just encourage you, and, and I always encourage people who ask me, what can I do? What can I do? Well, what are you passionate about, right? Um, and volunteer to your passion 
right? Put your energy into your passion because A, it's not work when you're putting your energy in your passion mm -hmm. and B, you're making a difference for something that people can see and feel that you're feeling it too, right? So yeah. you never feel like you don't, you have everything you need, but you just have to figure out what's my piece? What's my piece of this bigger puzzle? And you'll be fabulous. <laughs> yeah, and we, we are very concerned about when the rent moratorium is lifted and, and have started thinking of ways and, and preparing for ways in which to support the community when that does happen. Yeah. Thank you, Helen. Um, Michael, I'd, I'd love to hear, and then Kim, if you have some answers as well. Yeah, I, you know, I have a, I have a thought about, um, you, had, you had sort of said, you know, if, if not the police, sort of what other, what other ways are there? And I think that question is really important um, to answer. And I think there are a lot of good answers to it. And I, I hear a lot of tension around the question of, but there, but there will be police. And so what does that, what does that look like? Like, what is their role supposed to look like? Um, and several years ago, prior to Commissioner Hardesty being elected, there was a uh, walking patrol um, of the Portland police. And I did a sort of a walk along with them one night. Um, and it was really powerful. Like these were cops who, you know, were telling me that um, before they were assigned to that, they were sort of skeptical about it. Um, and what ended up happening is that they ended up developing relationships with people. Like they were out of their cars, they were walking around, they were getting to know people. And I walked around with them and they knew everybody's name. People were happy to see them. They knew if someone had, you know, turned in a job application, they knew, you know, someone, someone was like, where's my coat? And they didn't just have coats in the back of their cars, like they had a coat for that person. That person knew they were bringing them that coat and it changed their relationship to the community. And it changed um, the folks on the street relationship with them, not with the police writ large, with them. Um, and it was considered to be an, a model of policing that was too expensive. Um, and I am not, a, I'm not an expert on policing. Um, but we, you know, we have a tendency to like pump money into, you know, vice and sort of say like, you know, here are all these arrests, here are all these drugs that got pulled off the street, but there's just a cycle of the same people getting arrested and going back out on the street and nothing being accomplished. But what's powerful is when relationships are developed. Um, so I would love to see um, whatever the model is of the, of policing that we've, we know we will have be grounded in relationships like that. And I, I would just add that I, you know, I personally need to educate myself on who the hospitals are and, and really see where I could best utilize my resources and time and, and skills to, to help. Um, it, it really is real, I, it, even in, you know, recently with a, a friend who was um, who got son, father was killed from gun, vi gun, vi gun violence and, and also um, just having a situation recently with the houseless woman who um, living in her car and you, you do feel overwhelmed and, and um, helpless. But I think I really believe what uh, Commissioner Hardy said, if, where do you fit in? Well, how can you help? Um, and, you know, what can we do individually to really, you know, do our part? Because this is a crisis. And I, and I think that's what we're not getting, is that we're in the middle of a crisis. And so we really need to, that message needs to be, you know, uh, broadcast loud and clear, kind of like when, we, when the Van Park flood. It was a housing crisis. Everybody came together to help. Um, you know, so I, I, I do think we need to understand that we're in a housing crisis and just educate ourselves and find out um, ways to, that we can contribute. 
And I just want to quickly say thank you to Commissioner Hardesty for recognizing that we've been in a housing crisis for much longer than when it was declared. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to um, tell you about a program that I'm really excited about. Portland Street Response will start on February 16th. And for our listeners who haven't heard of Portland Street Response, it's modeled after Cahoots and Eugene. And it is the very first change to 911 uh, that we've made since the early 1900s, right? In the early 1900s, we went from being all voluntary uh, responders to 911 to actually paying people a living wage uh, to respond to 911 calls. Uh, but over the years, what we've done is uh, put police in the position to be all things to all people. Uh, police don't have housing in their back pocket. Uh, they don't have mental health services in their back pocket. They don't have social services in their back pocket. But we have become a, uh, a society that's very knee-jerk. Um, and, 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 and in fact, I, I, I will say that the police have reinforced this. If you see somebody you don't know, you see something, call the police. Well, what we now have is people calling the police. In fact, the biggest uh, increase in 911 calls over the last four years have been for unwanted people. And what are unwanted people? Uh, they look like me or they're houseless or they are talking to themselves or they are appear to be, uh, um, uh, to stand out in a particular community. Uh, and so when you think about the fact that the bulk of the increase in calls are for unwanted people. Clearly, we need another, we need something else. Because again, police, they have one job and their job is to solve crime. And when we're calling police to uh, go and check out homeless people, to go and find out why that guy is talking to himself, uh, what we do is put people in danger because someone who's in a mental health crisis does not follow orders. They do not do what they're told. Um, and so that leads to death in many cases for those community members. Uh, so, uh, so Portland Street Response will roll out on February 16th in the Lentz community. Uh, and what Lentz and what Portland Street Response includes is a certified mental health professional, a, a peer supporter, uh, a social worker, uh, and I always forget what the fourth, but there's a four person team. Um, and their job is to respond to 911 calls that are low acuity calls, which means no weapon, no talk of suicide ideation. Uh, and so they will be responding initially uh, to calls specifically in the Lentz community. So we will roll out with one band that will work Monday through Friday, but we have the resources to, to add up to four uh, uh, in our pilot year. Uh, but we're going to roll out the first one and see how that feels. Uh, and the good news is that because we are doing it in, in partnership with Portland State University's Houseless Collaborative, we will be invest, uh, evaluating it every step of the way from the day it rolls out so that we can make changes on a dime as necessary. So that's one non-police response. Uh, these folks have uniforms that don't look anything like police uniforms. They'll have a truck that looks nothing like a police truck. Um, and they, they, their whole job will be to uh, make people as comfortable as they can where they are. And if asked for references to support services, they will be able to connect them to those services. I'm also in, in, investigating um, a promising program that I've heard about, which is called um, uh, uh, Violence Interrupters. Um, and it's worked in other places across the country. Violence Interrupters could be uh, former felons uh, who have re-emerged uh, uh, re in local communities. Uh, they could be people who have had experience with the criminal justice system. But the primary thing they need to be are people who others in the community respect and look up to and will engage with, right? Uh, the goal with that, of course, is to have people intervene prior to the need to actually call 911 for police assistance. Uh, we, and so we're just starting to look at what that could look like. Uh, and I'm working with the city's Office of Violence Prevention uh, to actually make sure that we, are, uh, that we are providing support for people who may need it. Uh, one thing that I would like to see happen at the state level 
is that when people are coming back from incarceration, that they get a fifteen or sixteen hundred dollar check every month for the first six months. We send people out of prison back to communities that have radically changed, uh, and we say to them, "Get a job, get an apartment, uh, report to your parole and probation officer. If you need treatment, go get it and pay for it." Right, and we give them a bus ticket and send them back to town. It is an impossible task that we've given people, and I believe that if we gave people a chance to get settled. Right, we give them 16 months of support. I think we would find much more success with people returning from incarceration. Says so uh, law, the state law requires people coming back from incarceration to go back to their home community. And let me just say that census federal dollars don't follow those individuals back, and that's another change that we're going to have to make. And give them an opportunity to find work and housing because right now. <laughs> They're not accepted. <laughs> yeah, really a novel approach. I mean, how do you hit somebody with no money? You give them this long list of things that they have to do and a long list of things that they can't, they're prohibited from doing, right? Yeah. And then you give them a bus ticket and say, go forth and do good, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's not a good model to implement. No. I, I realize in, in listening to everyone's responses that, that the reason why I wanted to start the question, the conversation off with what does community mean is that it helps us to get out of this binary thinking of the housed and the houseless and it allows us to really think of the, the whole group and, and all of us being a part of this together so that there is less of a us versus them or, or or just the just just removing one extra layer of division that and and exclusion um, and and I I'm so appreciative of the ways that people have been um, responding to these questions. I realize I put the limit that we had to focus on housing, and then I asked the question about policing. But I think it's all related, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna give myself the, <laughs> the ask. Well, let me just say that policing uh, and housing is related. When you think about uh, for the last few years, over 50% of the arrests have been for people, but for being houseless, would have never been arrested. And you have to say to yourself, so, okay, yeah. so we're arresting people for crimes of poverty, like trespassing, like public urination, yeah. like uh, um, uh, um, uh, loitering, right? Uh, so, uh, and it's because when you call the police, they have very limited resources in their toolbox, right? And so if you call the police, they're going down their list and you know, that's what they come up with, right? It's a total waste yeah. of public dollars. It wastes Portland police dollars. It wastes the DA's dollars. It wastes the sheriff's dollars. And we have to ask ourselves, are we getting the results we want? And I say, no, right? Yeah. If not, yeah. then let's do something different. Totally, I, I agree. It looks like we have a question that came in. Um, it says, Oh, I'm not sure exactly what that, actually, um, the question is, what's the point of counting people who are incarcerated in the census if they will not count? And I'm not exactly sure what that means. You can write for federal dollars. You can say you can use that in your grant application to write for federal dollars. And when they ask you about the demographics of your community, uh, you may remember we had a governor that uh, prisons were economic development. So he put prisons in places that never saw people of color. Um, on any regular basis. And those communities now, if asked at a, at, in a federal grant, tell us about the demographics of your community. Oh. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I work for the city of Salem. That was my job was to count all the group home facilities, including prison, to make sure that there's an um, accurate count of, of and I, it's a good point, you know, why count them if they can't vote, they can't, you know, um, are not free to, you know, take advantage of the services that, you know, the census provides cities, you know, and the federal dollars. Also wanted to say, um, when I lived in Tacoma, I was part of a ministry called Rebuilding Families where we would work with the warden at um, Purdy Prison and, it, the whole point was to help women transition back into a community. And oftentimes they end up staying in a, in a community nearby 
who didn't welcome them. And like um, Commissioner Hardesty said, that they're, they're only giving like $40 um, to enough to get a taxi to wherever they're, they're going. So the mayor of Gig Harbor and the warden and several people from uh, my church, we got we started a nonprofit organization to try to help them transition. And we provided programs throughout the year to help, you know, empower women to, um, to have sustain themselves after and to kind of, so it, it is so important and it, it's often an unfor, you know, a forgotten group, you know, and, um, and they're not welcomed sometimes by their own family members when they get out. And so to send them back home is not a good, good deal because sometimes they're not wanted there either. So it's, you know, and that the whole prison reform is so needed because it doesn't really rehab, rehabilitate you know, it just makes the situation worse. And I, you know, in terms of the community, I, I think about the faith community and how important it is for them to, to rise up and really um, become involved. And I know there are groups out there who probably were some of the original people to really jump in and, and try to deal with some of the health situation. And, but uh, it, it's an overwhelming, you know, problem. And so it just can't be one, one group. But it needs to be, you know, a strong co coalition of people from the community to really help and um, you know, and get and help um, navigate the resources, the limited resources that are available to help. It's one of the great things that's come out of this pandemic is how much community aid exists out there. Not necessarily nonprofit, not necessarily faith based. But it's just been phenomenal watching community members come together and just say, we're adopting this camp and we're bringing food to this camp on these days of the week, right? Uh, we have community members who are spending, uh, great moms who are spending all day in the kitchen, right? Uh, cooking food and then having it delivered uh, to either shelters or folks who are living on the street. Um, I think we have to uh, uplift uh, the incredible work that community has done. As you know, we had limited uh, 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 federal resources come in to address the pandemic. And my priority was uh, getting money in the hands of people because today in, in Oregon, our number one crisis is food insecurity. Um, and so the fact that kids aren't in a school building, uh, there are two meals a day that those kids are no longer getting. Uh, and there are community efforts to make sure that those meals actually go home for them and and siblings that they have as well. Um, and so, I, 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 and 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 I should say, government can't do it all, right? So it cannot be we'll sit back and see what the city, state, county does, and then we'll step up because government will always have limited resources, right? Um, and we do uh, today, now that I, uh, with me on the city council and my other colleagues, we really do prioritize uh, the most, uh, 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 the, the communities that have had the least access uh, to information resources, right? So we're really focused on that. But what warms my heart is to see so many people that uh, aren't attached to organizations or faith institutions that just come together and say, okay, we're gonna, kick, we're gonna cook in my kitchen on Saturday, right? We're gonna put all these individual packets together and we're gonna take them out and we're gonna feed people, right? There are people that are doing that every single day. And to those people, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you, right? That's the blessings we have in this community is that people step up in ways that I've, I would have never imagined prior to the pandemic. So there is good news, even though we're in the midst of four crises at one time, there is good news that people are people who can are stepping up in ways that they never imagined they would. Thank you. It looks like we had a, a question that came in on the chat for Kim that I that I missed earlier. Um, this is a question about the uh, Portland Public Schools. This is with the changes of some of the PPS schools. I'm wondering if any um, Black pioneers from Oregon were suggested. Kim, do you have any information on um, curriculum development and, and if Oregon Black pioneers or how Oregon Black pioneers is is participating in that? You know, I know uh, we get that request often. Um, and I'm sure when we start our next strategic planning session, 
we're going to prioritize curriculum development. Um, we're seeking members on our board who have that expertise, um, and um, and especially in response to that state legislation, state, state legislation that a uh, multicultural curriculum. Um, and so um, we really it, we realize it's a need, and we 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 get asked often. And I'm really hoping that um, we can have a, a package that we can give to. Um, teachers to help broaden the, um, you know, teachings about, you know, Black settlers and, and uh, especially, you know, in the fifth grade, you get this special training on the Oregon, you know, uh, Oregon Trail, but they don't talk about all the African Americans that came across the trail and the explorers and, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, a, it's a dated curriculum that needs to be updated. But, um, and we're trying to do, come up with a, a solution that doesn't cap what, our capacity, but something that can be, you know, shared. And we, we also have a virtual exam that's being developed. And it should be online in June, and that's going to help. So we're, we're really trying to think of a way that we can do this to get the information out. In a way, yeah. that Kim, when you when you do help organizations, they should pay you. That's a fact. <laughs> yeah, the school district as well. Yeah. Um, we have. I think we're actually coming up on our time here. Um, I. I'm looking for one more question that I want to come up with, and I'm sort of we have someone. So, the third grade Portland history book needs help. So, <laughs> it's a lot of, yeah. I, I actually, um, I, I, I think about in my mind. There's there's a time before I knew how I five came up Portland the way it is, and then there's a time after I knew what, why I five is is where it is at. And I, for for me learning the history of a place does so much to inform why it is we stand where we do and and why communities have have grown the way they have and and Kim when you were telling me the other day about the the Mount Scott farm and the the cemetery and the, and just to find out tonight that the the couple actually is buried there is just really kind of is just that that sense of place that we have in generationally and very moving. Um, what? Well, we'll just sort of leave it open when, in closing thoughts, and um, we'll give everybody the chance to um, to. Okay, two questions. Well, it's not a question. Closing thoughts. That's a statement. Give me your closing thoughts, and then second, do you think it'll snow this week? <laughs> uh, Kim, let's start with you. <laughs> You know, I, I recently wrote a, a little history thing for my church at Mount Olivet about John C. Logan. And he was, a, you know, one of the founders of Mount Olivet, but he, you know, kind of, that was a conservative little church, but he, um, Marcus Garvey, back to Africa movement appealed to him. And the reason why is, is because it's similar to what uh, Al Sharpen said, we just want your knee off our neck. And, and, and he pretty much said the same thing. He said, it, you know, Catherine Bogo wrote that the Back to Africa appealed to um, Logan because he wanted African Americans to feel free to um, live and without um, hindrance from another race. And I think that's what, you know, and it goes beyond race now where you have millions of houseless people who just want the right to, to have a house. I mean, that should be a universal, you know, benefit. We should not have houseless in the United States. And, um, and I think, you know, as a community, we need to rise up um, and really help, you know, our houseless and, and, and help to buffer that, um, that tension between policing and, and, and housing. And, and um, 
I say one more thing. When I was working on Alba in a community plan, I was a new planner at the time. We had a wonderful community policing that I think Michael, you were talking about, but it, it was just a wonderful um, uh, tool. And when I would go to all these neighborhood meetings, we would hear reports back from the, the police officers, but it, they were, you know, on the streets. We had neighborhood, um, I remember Richard Brown, um, you guys might know him. He was, he had a wonderful group that was, you know, um, helping to, you know, get to know people, making sure the communities were safe, and it was a, a community group. And so I, you know, I, I love what Commissioner Hardy you say about the community people who are just taking it on their own initiative, not part of a face, face group, or it's just neighbors loving neighbors and wanting to help, you know, so I, I'm excited to be a part of this. I learned so much today and just really inspired to be a part of the solution. Do you think it'll snow, Kim? No, because <laughs> last time they said it was going to snow and I think it, it was felt a little more brisk than it is today. <laughs> and it didn't snow, so and I was looking forward to it. So. <laughs> Well, I unmuted so I could go next because I don't want to have to follow Commissioner Hardesty with final thoughts. So <laughs> um, I do think it will snow. I don't think it's going to snow a lot, but I think it's going to snow and I'm going to see it. I don't care when it happens. I'm going to see it. <laughs> um, my closing thought, I'm going to try to um, weave together the first question of what does community mean and um, the Louisa Flowers, um, because I think um, one thing that community means is um, whose stories are reflected um, and who do we remember, who do we um, talk about as being part of the creation of our city, of our community. Um, and when we found our way to the Flowers family. Our first thought was to name the building after Alan Flowers, who has also an amazing story. Um, but we also tend to tell the stories of men in the creation of cities. Um, and as we learned tonight, the story of Louisa is amazing all on its own and deserves to be on the side of that building. So that's my final thought. So are you just waiting for us to jump in? I thought you were going to call on us. So I, you're trying to wait us out, huh? See which one of us would crack first. Okay, I guess I cracked first. Uh, <laughs> I want to say that every time I hear Kimberly speak, I learn something new. Um, and it always connects with people that I've met since I've lived in Portland. I've lived here for over 30 years, but I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. So Portland has always fascinated me because it really is a, a story. It is a, it is a city of two stories. Um, and it's just, it, it's a story of uh, white settlers and people of color. And the stories aren't intertwined mostly. Uh, mostly they're told from one perspective or another, but they're never intertwined. And uh, that's kind of sad, uh, but it is, it is who Portland is. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I will say in my closing um, that uh, um, this pandemic um, has pointed out a lot of inequities that have existed since the founding of Oregon. Um, and what I hope we learn through this pandemic is that um, whether we talk, uh, these are terms that I, I, I today find offensive when people talk about marginalized communities. Uh, communities don't marginalize themselves. They're marginalized because those with power don't want to share power with those who don't have power, right? Uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when I first got here, uh, uh, you know, people would like be talking minorities all the time and I'd be like, what are they talking about? They go, idiot, they're talking about you, right? Because um, Oregon has never been the melting pot uh, that it should be. And what I hope is that our experience this summer 
with this reckoning, this racial justice reckoning that happened all over the world, that every governmental structure will reevaluate itself for the white supremacy base that it operates under and start the work of dismantling those white supremacist systems. Um, what I hope is that every governmental entity is looking at what do we do differently as we come out of this pandemic and we start imagining what the future looks like. Uh, what I hope is that uh, we will no longer blame people because of the disparate outcomes that people experience. Um, I've never found a, a, a document that put the blame where it belonged, which is on white supremacist systems and racism that actually determine who's worthy and who isn't. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do to just change the words. Words are powerful. And every time I hear somebody say marginalized, it makes me cringe because Nobody is born marginalized. Uh, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I think I'll be a marginalized community person today, right? Uh, the people who are marginalized had no say in it. Um, and I hope that all of us will like uh, 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 police our own language and make sure that we're using language that's inclusive and, um, and respectful, regardless of who we're talking to. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight. And I very... I have enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Um, you were right, Michael. <laughs> um, I have learned. I have. I have a whole bunch of notes that I have scribbled down tonight. I have learned. I've learned a lot. And um, on a personal level, the question of community is. You know, now I'm anxious to go downstairs and pull my girls together and ask them this question and ask the question is, and who are we, how are we creating community and how, what is our responsibility and are we living up to that responsibility? So that's, that's a personal note. And, um, and there's a lot here that I want to share with them because thankfully they are really interested. And, and then from the friendly house perspective, um, there's, there's, a lot here um, too, when I think about, you know, we're writing our strategic plan this year and um, we already put it on hold so that we could, we could um, have an equity audit done and then, um, and have, have that equity audit kind of drive how we choose to move forward. But I think it, it, I think there are some questions that have come out of this tonight for us to ask as well, as we look at how we want to be a part of the next chapter of, in Portland and, um, and who, who, who do we want to partner with in, in saddling up and, and linking arms to, to, to write this next chapter. Um, I, this has just been marvelous. Sandra, thank you so much for the work that you've done. Your questions were really thoughtful. And Kimberly, thank you so much for bringing this, this important piece of history um, to all of us. It, it really is, is critical and I really appreciate the work that you did for this. Do you think it'll snow? I am really <laughs> hoping it's going to snow. I'm hoping it doesn't. Uh, Portlanders can't handle snow. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know that is true, um, but I really wanted to snow. <laughs> I I hope it'll snow, but I'll wait till I see it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, Thank you. Also, we have a little uh, thing in the chat here. Thanks to all of you with your wisdom and personal thoughts. This is from Tom Thomas. We are living in this now normal and look towards a better future. We all need to be a part of creating, and those are the the best ways for us to sign off. Um, so much thanks for everybody for taking time out to be here tonight. And um, I so appreciate you all. Have a wonderful night and go out and do all the good things that you've already been doing. <laughs> thanks to Rebecca and Denise for tech support from, the, from behind the scenes. All right, good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>